What's the first thing you learn about the world of Jack and Daxter? That Naughty Dog were ahead of their time? Well, besides that, we learn that Eco turns people orange and furry. Maybe it was just a one-off, or maybe it's only Dark Eco that does it. Either way, we're not taking any chances. We don't know how dangerous the other Eco is. So from now on, no more Eco. Period. Can you beat Jack and Daxter, the precursor legacy, without Eco? Let's find out. Here are the rules, but first, I want to tell you about a game I know you've already heard about, but have you ever given it a try for yourself? That's right, it's Raid Shadow Legends, the game name that just rolls off the tongue. Let me tell you why you should be giving Raid a chance. Awesome champions, intense PvE and PvP, tactical upgrade systems, turn-based combat, Raid has it all. And honestly, as good as all that is, it's not even my favourite thing about the game. It's the visuals that do it for me, whether it's it be the characters, the environments, or the many adversaries you'll be pitted against. They all look amazing, even on mobile. The sheer variety of champions on offer makes for some amazing looking concept art as well. I'm a sucker for good art like this. In fact, the quality of the game's visuals has resulted in the fans asking for a raid animated series, and they delivered. It's called Raid Call of the Arbiter, and it's already well underway, so be sure to check that out on the Raid YouTube channel. There's even brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty Orc Warlord, Artak. If you want him, all you have to do is log into Raid for 7 days between now and the 24th of July. Click on my link in the description or scan the QR code in the corner of the screen now to download Raid Shadow Legends for free. Plus, if you're a new player, then clicking on my link or scanning my QR code will give you a free starter pack worth 30 be sure to check out Raid Call of the Arbiter and thank you for downloading Raid Shadow Legends and thank you Raid for sponsoring this video. Back to the rules. Rule number one, we cannot collect or touch any eco of any colour at all. Rule number two, glitches are fine, just no hacking. And rule number three, once we defeat Gol and Maya, the final boss of the game, we win. We will be playing this on the open goal version of the game on PC, but everything you see in this video should be possible on all versions. As usual, we will be attempting the highest completion percentage possible as we go. The original Jack and Daxter is something of a collectathon, and the game's three main collectibles are power cells, precursor orbs, and scout flies. The total amount of power cells and orbs vary from level to level, but there will always be seven scout flies in every level. The total number of power cells in the whole game is 101, and the total number of orbs is 2000, and the total number of scout flies is 112. We start in the tutorial level, Geyser Rock. There are four power cells here and 50 orbs. Getting all seven scout flies always rewards us with one power cell, so we only actually need to find three power cells. The scout flies are always inside these red boxes, and we need to use a ground pound to break them. We will also see a lot of wooden chests all over the game, and these contain green eco, which is how Jack recovers his HP. However, if we're swearing off eco completely, then even the green eco is off limits. Fallen enemies will drop green eco too. It is possible to avoid eco from the chests or enemies as long as we're careful, but it does mean that we won't be able to heal in this entire run. It isn't long before we come to an eco tutorial. Collecting different coloured eco provides Jack with different temporary power-ups. Blue eco is used to power up technology like this door blocking our way. It also gives Jack a bit of a speed boost and it even attracts orbs to us. We won't be seeing any of those benefits in this run though. Getting beyond this door is the only way to progress, so we need to find another way to the other side. Jack has a lot of options when it comes to platforming, double jump, high jump, long jump, etc. So we need to take advantage of Jack's arsenal of moves. If we stand on the wooden post of the nearby bridge, we can use a high jump to reach the very edge of a rock sticking out of the wall. From here we can jump on 
onto a bigger rock with a flatter surface. Unfortunately, as we're not really meant to be standing on this rock, Jack tends to slide off automatically, and the game doesn't let us jump whilst we're sliding. If we can move towards the cliff, Jack will slide into it and he can remain stationary. That allows us to high jump over to the next rock closer to the door. We perform a spin kick in mid-air for a bit of extra hang time, and to be more precise with our landing, we now want to high jump to the rock above us, but it's just out of reach, and we slide right off. To get around this, all we need to do is ground pound at the apex of our high jump. We're able to ground pound the slidey surfaces, and the extra bounce we get from this is just enough to land on top of the cliff. There's an invisible wall preventing us from squeezing beyond the door, and the camera really struggles in areas we're not meant to be in. If we slide away from the door a little bit, we can jump on top of it. We're able to stand up now without slipping, but there's still an invisible wall in our way. However, all we need to do is use Jack's punch attack to thrust right through the barrier and fall down to the other side of the door. We grab the power cell on the other side and move on. That is the only major hurdle in the tutorial in a no eco run. All the orbs are out in the open and the eco is all very avoidable. There is some blue eco at the end to power up a platform that takes us to the exit, but we can just fall back down to the beach instead. A spin kick can even be used as we get close to the ground to prevent fall damage. That's Geyser Rock 100% complete. With that, we enter Sandover Village, the game's first hub area. Here we mostly just accept quests from the townsfolk. They either request us to complete a task, or they want a very specific amount of orbs. Either way, we're rewarded with power cells, so we need to do as many quests as we can. There's also a precursor oracle in each of the game's hub areas that will trade a couple of power cells for our orbs. There's some blue eco here and there, but it's not mandatory to progress. In fact, here it's used to open these blue eco vents on the ground, which rewards us with some orbs. Since we can't open those, it means that any orbs within these vents are all always going to be off limit to us. We grab all the collectibles we can find, herd the farm animals into their pen and move on to Sentinel Beach. Right away we see a bunch of wooden crates in a grid with one red box at the back. We need to be careful not to break open the wooden ones as we ground pound the red one, just in case we accidentally touch any green eco. There are a total of 8 power cells here and 6 of them can be obtained no problem as they don't require any eco at all. There are tasks in this area that normally require collecting eco, so here's the first First task. We need to break all of these rocks to unblock the green eco vents. The problem is, as soon as we break a rock, Jack touches the green eco right away. We're simply too close to the rock when we break it, so if we stand about a step away from the rock, perform a spin kick and a small jump away at the same time, we can just break the rock and avoid touching the green eco. Do this with all the rocks and we get a power cell. Now here's the second task. There's a tower in the ocean and we want to get on top of it. Normally, we would use the blue eco lying around to power up jump pads that would launch you high into the air and on top of the tall rocks. There would be more jump pads from there that would get you onto the tower, so we're going to need another way. We can swim to the base of the tower, but if you swim too far out, a giant fish straight up eats you. This fish swims faster than we do, so the odds that it will catch up to us are very high. However, there is an unintentional method of swimming even faster than the fish. Instead of holding the direction towards where you want to swim, tap the direction over and over in a rhythm, and Jack will now swim like this. It looks odd, but it's faster. This helps us swim to the base of the tower without getting eaten. We need to stand on the rock to the left of the archway. A high jump into a spin kick will give us just enough height to grab the ledge above us. There is a window in the tower here with a big wooden frame, and it's far too high to jump on top of normally. However, there is another trick in this game, and it's called the infinite jump. It isn't quite what it sounds like, I'll explain. In this game there are different kinds of surfaces, floors, walls, water, etc. Each one is programmed differently of course, but the floor is the only one that's really considered solid ground. This means that Jack can jump off the floor when he's standing on it. Makes sense so far. However, some of the vertical walls in this game are programmed as floor for some reason. There aren't very many and they're mostly walls in areas where we're not supposed to reach on foot. But this window is a perfect example. Since the game is supposed to let Jack jump if he is in contact with the floor, and the game considers 
considers the window to be a floor, we can actually jump off the window infinitely as long as we're touching it. Jack will still jump vertically, so we can consider this kind of an unintentional wall jump. And with this, it's possible to just make it on top of the wooden frame. Jumping to the very top from here is quite simple, and we can take out the enemies up here. We just need to be careful not to collect any of their green eco. Thankfully, green eco despawns after a few seconds, so we can just wait until then if any green eco gets in our way. With that, we have the last power cell on the beach. We still want all the orbs though. There are some metal crates on the tall rocks and on the beach, and we want to break them open by firing the cannon at them to reveal the orbs inside. But we still need to go get them. The ones on the beach are easy to get to, but getting on the tall rocks is a challenge. To reach them, we need to use another unintended trick called the boosted jump. This is a tricky one to get the hang of, but it's going to prove very useful quite a lot in this run, so we need to learn it. Here's how it works. We need to combine three of Jack's moves together in a combo. The punch, the uppercut, and the spin kick. We can combine these in quick succession anytime, but it's when we perform them over an edge that they really shine. If we slowly walk over an edge, as soon as Jack starts to fall down, we quickly punch, uppercut, and then spin kick. If we get the input timings right, we will achieve crazy distance. It took a lot of practice, but we were eventually able to use this to make it from the tower to each of the tall rocks and collect the last few orbs. This leaves us 20 orbs short of the maximum, but that's because they're stuck inside another blue eco vent. Moving on to the forbidden jungle. There are many orbs lying around and floating in the air. Some are too high up and our high jumps aren't enough to reach them all, like these ones up here. We're supposed to get launched up to these orbs, but that requires blue eco. Instead, we use the trees to our advantage. The tree trunks themselves aren't considered to be floor, but the branches are. We can get a high jump into a spin kick to just land on a nearby tree branch and now we can walk to the very tip of the branch to get as close to the orbs as possible. We're still just out of reach with any regular jump but if we perform the boosted jump again we can reach all of them. It took a few tries but we got them eventually. We make our way to the fisherman making sure to grab all the orbs and scout flies that we see on the way and we complete the fish catching mini game. After that we move on to the main objective. We avoid the enemies and climb this machine we grab the orbs on top and make sure to avoid touching this blue laser since it will give us blue eco. If we go around it and break the wooden stand behind it, and then from there we can complete the laser puzzle as normal to earn a power cell. Now we need to try and get the power cells that normally require using eco to reach. First, there's a sealed door that blue eco would normally open. We can't get the door open any other way, so we'll have to approach this from a different angle. If we high jump against this rock, near the machine from earlier, we can actually get over it and fall out of bounds. We need to try and grab onto the edge of the mainland as we fall. We pull ourselves up, but make sure not to move forward too much, because if we do, we risk getting pushed back in bounds. We make our way across the edge whilst staying clipped into the rock wall until we get here. Once we're here, we want to fall down into the out of bounds water. We swim around the rock in front of us, and now we need to stay close to the rock to our left or will fall into the void and die. When we get to this rock in front of us, we need to double jump on top of it, but it's quite precise as it needs to be on a certain part of the rock. It's the part that causes Jack to slide off, and if we can very quickly press the first person button in the brief time that Jack is sliding, then the game will enter first person as if we're standing on solid ground. Since Jack can't move from the spot when in first person, he can't fall either, so he stays on the slightly sloped rock like this. From here, we can see that we are underneath the temple, so we aim the camera towards the underneath of the ramp that leads to the sealed door. Now, as soon as we exit first person, we can quickly perform an action as if Jack was standing on flat ground. We could use this to get a jump off the rock, but that won't be enough to reach under the ramp. Instead, we use this to get a boosted jump. 
we very quickly punch after exiting first person, perform the uppercut into a spin kick right afterwards, and if we've aimed it right, we can just land on the ground under the ramp. From here, we carefully make our way to the top edge, which is directly underneath the room behind that sealed door. The ground in that room isn't solid from underneath, so we can clip right through from the bottom to get in the room, but it's just too high up. Even if we use a high jump spin kick, but since we still get close enough to the floor to make contact with it, we can spam the jump button after the high jump to get an extra jump, exactly like what happened with the window that we jumped against earlier. It's hard to see due to the camera, but this does get us inside the room, and we can collect the power cell inside. Although, since we never opened the door, we're now trapped inside. There is a simple solution to this. Whenever we grab a power cell, the game auto-saves. If we load that auto-save, we'll keep our progress with the collectibles, but we'll spawn at our most recent checkpoint, which is at the start of the Forbidden Jungle. We now want to get that seventh scout fly. Six of them are easy to reach in the Forbidden Jungle, but the seventh one is located high up on the roof of the temple. Normally, you would use the jump pads powered by Blue Eco to get up there, so let's use an unintended method instead. We mentioned it before, the tree branches can be stood on, and there just so happens to be a tree right next to the temple. The awkward part about this is that we need to jump from branch to branch to branch until we make it to the highest one. It was hard enough to land on just one branch, but with some practice we can make it. It's really awkward to see due to all of the leaves, but with some trial and error you'll get there eventually. On the highest branch, we can only stand on it if we're on the very tip, and from there we can easily double jump to the temple roof. We break the red box, avoiding the wooden boxes, and earn the power cell for the seventh scout fly. The remaining three power cells in the Forbidden Jungle are completely unobtainable. One of them is on the very top of the temple roof, far out of our reach without jump pads, and the other two are both inside the temple itself, and the only way inside the temple is from the very roof. And even if we can get inside, Blue Eco is required to exit the temple as well. We'll just have to cut our losses here. We have 5 out of 8 power cells and 77 out of 150 orbs. The remaining orbs are either also on the roof of the temple, inside the temple, or or in a blue eco vent. We will head to the next level now, Misty Island. And a lot of this level can be done casually. There are some tricks we need to use though. Early on, we see a far away platform with a power cell on it. We can clearly see a blue eco platform that we're meant to power up to get us over there. But instead, we can use the tried and true boosted jump to only just reach the platform. As we make our way through the rest of the level, we grab all the orbs and scout flies we find along the way but there's something we need to remember. There is a specific scout fly in this level that we need to collect last. We'll see why soon. Eventually, we come across a big door that would normally require Blue Eco to open, but we can use the terrain to our advantage. To the left of the door, we can stand on a rock and high jump onto the wall. We don't get over the wall like this, but the game thought that we were on the other side for a brief moment, so the door opens automatically. Inside, we must defeat an army of lurkers lurkers, whilst bombs are fired down onto us. Every lurker drops eco when defeated, either green or red, so we need to be careful not to collect any of this during the fight. Thankfully, unlike blue eco, green and red eco despawn after a few seconds. There's also an orb right next to some blue eco, which is a little scary, but thankfully we can spin kick to just touch the orb, but not eco. When we get to the high wooden bridge, we see a scout fly box part way but this is the one we need to save for last. So we skip this one until we have the other six first. At the top, we use the cannon to break open the metal crates below for more orbs. Shortly after that, we're supposed to use a zoomer vehicle to ram into the balloon lurkers. But the problem with that is that Jack gains green eco automatically when each balloon lurker is defeated. So instead, we'll use the zoomer to grab all the orbs floating on the water. We can also use it to reach another power cell and the sixth scout fly, but we still need another way to get these balloon lurkers, and that is exactly why we save that one specific scout fly on the bridge for last. Whenever we collect the seventh and last scout fly in any given
given level, that same spot is where the power cell reward will spawn. Saving this scout fly for last will ensure that the power cell spawns on this bridge. The reason we want the power cell to be on this bridge is due to the dark eco crate that is now right next to the power cell. We've seen a few dark eco crates several times during this run so far, but since dark eco hurts Jack, we've simply avoided it, as we would in a casual playthrough anyway. It's debatable in the community whether touching dark eco voids the challenge for a no eco run, since Jack doesn't actually collect dark eco or use it in any way. With that information, it's up to you if you think this next trick is allowed or not, but it was too interesting to not show. If we collect a power cell and take fatal damage on the exact same frame, the game gets a bit confused. To do this, we need to take damage to ensure that we are one hit away from death. Then stand close to both the Dark Eco Crate and the Power Cell. Then all we do is spin kick on the spot. Spin kicking extends Jack's hitbox outward all around. This means that Jack touches the Power Cell and the Dark Eco at the exact same time. Touching a Power Cell initiates a cutscene which takes place instead of the Dark Eco killing Jack. But the game still kind of thinks that Jack is dead too. This puts Jack in a weird zombie state. In this state, we can still move around, but the side effects to this means that we can no longer collect anything. This means we can't collect eco either, so now we can safely kill the balloon lurkers without getting green eco. Except another side effect of this glitch is that we can no longer ride the zoomer. So this means that we must defeat the balloon lurkers on foot. Two of them fly right over this bridge, so we can hit them as they pass over. We just need to be careful of the rolling log and the two explosive mines that hang from the balloons. Now the green eco will just drop down onto the ground instead of going into Jack. If we look over the edge of the bridge behind us, we can see another balloon lurker passing by. As it starts to descend, we can jump off and spin kick it on the way down. We land in water, but we can use the fast swim method to get back on land quickly before the giant fish eats us. There's a second balloon lurker on that same cycle, so we can climb back up to the bridge again. Just just be careful since we're one hit away from death the whole time we're in this zombie state. After getting the fourth balloon lurker, the best way to reach the remaining two is from the island. We can use either a long jump or a boosted jump for some good distance, and then we must use the fast swim technique to outpace the fish. The balloon lurkers fly right over this island, so hitting them is easy. The power cell spawns in a tunnel where we were, but even if we were able to get back there, the zombie glitch would mean we can't collect it. Fortunately, if we die and respawn, this removes the zombie glitch and the power cell stays where it is, so we can collect it no problem. We will be avoiding dark eco crates in this run going forward as it is still eco. The fact that getting the zombie glitch like we did doesn't actually see Jack getting hit by the dark eco is what makes this glitch a grey area, but you're free to decide for yourselves, let me know in the comments. That is 8 out of 8 power cells and 130 5 out of 150 orbs, since 15 of them are inside yet another blue eco vent. After sailing back to Sandover Village, we hand in all our quests and trade in all our orbs for more power cells. That is 6 out of 6 power cells here too, but again only 35 out of 50 orbs due to more eco vents. Fire Canyon is up next, and it's just a Zuma ride over lava, but we need to make sure we hit every metal crate on the way, whilst avoiding the dark eco crates and the wooden crates. We also need to hit every red crate for the scout flies. That rewards us with a power cell, as does just making it to the end. That's 2 out of 2 power cells and 50 out of 50 orbs in the fire canyon. This leads us to the second hub area, Rock Village. We grab all the collectibles we can and accept all the quests. We can trade in more orbs for more power cells, but we need to visit the neighbouring areas to find those orbs. We start with the Precursor Basin, and this whole area is only accessible on the Zuma. We need to drive into the metal crates to break them open, but there are multiple dark eco crates and wooden crates dotted all around as well. We need to make sure we don't drive into any of those or we avoid the challenge right then and there. Avoiding these certain crates makes this part quite challenging, as most power cells here require speeding around. 
There's a race against the clock, there's driving through rings, there's herding moles back into their holes, etc. The most difficult part is getting these metal crates on these tall platforms as they're right next to wooden crates, and if our aim is slightly off, we'll either hit the wooden crate or just fall off. But with some precision, it is very possible to avoid the wooden crates and only hit the metal ones. There are two segments that see us driving through rings. This is very awkward, but perseverance sees us through. The race against the clock isn't too bad either. We just need to dodge the crates and the eco on the course, and we can still make it in just less than 45 seconds. We can even get all 200 orbs in the precursor basin too, as there are no orb vents. There is a power cell we cannot get, however. It requires us to use eco to heal these plants. And considering the power cell doesn't even spawn in until we've used the eco, we can never get this one. Another power cell is awarded by chasing and ramming into these flying lurkers, but the issue with this is that they give us green eco automatically when we hit one, just like on Misty Island with the balloon lurkers. It seems that we need to use the same zombie glitch as before, except we're stuck on the zoomer here. Plus there aren't any power cells in the precursor basin next to dark eco crates or any anything else that can hurt us. We haven't forgotten about the flying lurkers, but for now, we'll move on to the next area, Boggy Swamp. There's a lot of yellow eco in this level, and it's used to obtain a fair few collectibles throughout. In fact, there are four large rocks that can only be broken with yellow eco, and they each reward us with a power cell. That's four power cells we already can't get. Plus, there's a first person shooting mini game that automatically gives us yellow eco, so that's a fifth power cell we can't get. We also see several metal crates all over the level that would normally require yellow eco to break. We can at least still reach every other orb lying around. Some might require us to damage boost through the swamp water though. We saw some orbs above a blue eco jump pad, but we found that if you use a ground pound, hold jump as we hit the ground, to bounce back up and then spin kick at the apex, we can just reach these orbs without eco. There is one section of this level where we can find a flut flut, a large bird that we can ride. The flut flut can break open the metal crates with either a charge or a stomp, which is perfect since we don't have any other way to break break them without eco. The Flut Flut can jump quite far too, so the collectibles around here are easy to get. Unfortunately, the section we find the Flut Flut is the only section in the level that we can ride it. There are invisible barriers preventing us from taking the Flut Flut anywhere else in the swamp, which is a shame since there are many other metal crates that we need to break. There's only one thing for it. We're getting the Flut Flut out of here. If we stand on this particular wooden platform and then double jump into the wall Right here, we can clip right through. It's very easy to fall into the void and die here, but it's also possible to just land on the very edge of the swamp. Now we can use the flut flut to platform out of bounds, until we find a spot that clips us back in bounds and into a section of the swamp where the flut flut normally wouldn't be allowed. Now we can traverse the entire swamp and break every single metal crate we can find. The deadly swamp water doesn't even hurt the flut flut either, so the crates in the water can be broken too. Don't try to leave Boggy Swamp entirely with the Flut Flut or the game will just crash. With all the metal crates out of the way, that means we have 200 out of 200 orbs. All we have left to get is two more power cells. One is hidden in an area that requires a blue eco jump pad to reach, and the second one is for getting all seven scout flies, except the seventh scout fly is also in an area that requires a jump pad to reach. There is another way to reach these areas and it's by using a trick called zoom walking. Just like we saw when out of bounds in Forbidden Jungle, it's possible to quickly enter first person view when sliding off an edge. If we make our way to the first deadly swamp water at the start of Boggy Swamp, there is a sweet spot where Jack will fall through the swamp water and into the void. However, if we quickly enter first person view as we fall, we can remain stationary like this part way under the swamp water. Here is where we perform zoom walking. If we double tap the first person view button now, we will exit and then very quickly re-enter first person view. In the short time between the two button taps, we we see Jack fall down a tiny bit, since he is supposed to be falling. We can repeat this several times until Jack is beneath the whole level. Now, exactly as we did in Forbidden Jungle, we aim the camera in the right direction, towards the wall, exit first person, and then very quickly jump up onto the other side of the wall. This is a method we can continue to use in this area 
to go under certain walls. We can travel out of bounds on the level's edge once again until we get to this wall. A couple more jumps and we can clip through the wall and into the area we should not have been able to reach. There's a couple of enemies but we also find the last scout fly for another power cell. The only way back out of here however is to reload the auto save the game just made when we grabbed that power cell. This puts us right back at the boggy swamp entrance. We need to use a similar method to reach another closed off area that would only be reachable with jump pads. Since there is a pool of water nearby we can actually just use it to submerge under the wall and then surface again on the other side. We continue on in this pool and follow the wall to the right double jumping our way along it. Eventually we come to an edge so we use the same method as before to go under the wall although instead of double jumping we can quickly perform a punch into an uppercut for some forward distance as well. There's a couple of enemies and some yellow eco to avoid here but we also find the last scout fly close to the end of the whole boggy swamp just before the fourth rock that's close to an eco vent there is another corner of the swamp that we can use to get out of bounds the method this time is to crouch in the very corner and we can damage boost our way under the wall and very quickly jump back out before we take further damage we make our way left from here but we need to be careful as some parts of the ground isn't solid if we head left but stick to the right wall we can get over a bit further we now want to use the zoom walk again to look under this wall if we see the bottom of this floating device on the other side then we know we have the right spot we don't even have to do anything fancy there's actually a water surface down here and since we're partly under the ground we can fall into it and then submerge under the wall and emerge on the other side we actually got stuck inside the wall doing this but we were still just able to touch the trigger for the cutscene that would normally play when entering this area we need to defeat the horde of enemies here and just like on misty island we also need to avoid Avoid collecting any of their dropped eco. We can run around picking our spots until the dropped eco despawns. Defeating them all earns us the last power cell that we can get in the boggy swamp, which is only 3 out of 8. We did get all 200 orbs at least. Oh yeah, and the only way back out of here is to reload our autosave again. Our next level is the Lost Precursor City, and this is a tough one. We need to make sure to complete each part of this level in a very specific way, otherwise we risk soft flocking ourselves in a no eco run. I'll explain why, as and when this becomes relevant. The level itself is full of platforming sections over electrified water, but a lot of the collectibles early on can be obtained casually. Now and then we see an orb close to some eco, but we can still avoid the eco if we're careful enough. We want to break open the red scout flight boxes as we go, but it's very important that we save a specific one for last again. We can break the first and second red boxes that we see without consequence but soon we find ourselves here in this big room on the right there is the third red box but this is the one we need to save for last we'll see why later we can follow the pipes as normal for another power cell and two more scout flies when the path forks later on we head right beyond the whirlpools to earn another power cell with this small platforming puzzle the other path is where things get interesting we can get the power cell across these platforms no problem but there's a door here that we can't open without eco. We want the power cell behind that door. And last time we needed to get beyond a door like this, we had to go out of bounds. So that's exactly what we'll do here. Nearby, there is a slide that leads to the next part of the level. And the roof of this slide perhaps isn't as solid as it should be. If we can get enough height, we can get through the roof but the only way to get that height is to use the two lurkers wandering around here, so don't kill them. One of them is giving the other a ride on his shoulders, and would you believe, we can actually stand on top of them as if they're a moving platform. So we lure them over to the slide, high jump onto their heads, and then high jump through the roof. It's very easy to fall into the void and die here, but if we're precise enough, we can land on the very edge of the electrified water. We're very likely going to take damage doing this so make sure we got full health first. We need to double jump out of the water and into a spin kick to reach a platform above. Jack will actually gain even more height when jumping out of the water if we remain stationary as we jump. Combine that with a double jump and you can just reach a platform above us. Visibility is a bit poor but we need to jump around the door from here to clip into the room from the side. After we get the power cell, the door actually opens for us now that we're on the other side of it, so we can get out of the room no problem. Now, if we go down the slide, we can't get back up again the same way. The reason that this is important is 
that the game very much intends for us to use a lot of blue eco jump pads to escape this level once we reach the end. If we slide all the way to the bottom of the level, we find the last power cell, but we are then soft locked due to being checkpointed down there. However, far off parts of this level are deloaded as we haven't reached them yet. However, the power cells stay loaded in. This means that there's a power cell loaded in deep down far beneath us. Earlier, we used this giant button to raise some platforms for a few seconds. After a few seconds, the platform forms sink again and the button rises back up. If we hit the button and then stay crouched on the button, as soon as the time runs out and the button rises, we then perform a high jump into a spin kick against the wall. The slight upward momentum from the button rising can provide us with just enough height to get over the invisible barrier and go right over the top. We're now falling into the void, but as we mentioned, the level isn't loaded in, but the power cell is. We just need to use spin kicks to slow our descent just enough to be able to touch this power cell on the way down. Make sure not to miss it though as we'll be stuck down here. After collecting it we will just fall to our deaths but the power cell is still saved in our inventory. We can now finally descend down the slide as normal. It can be tricky though, we need to avoid all dark eco and green eco crates whilst collecting every orb and breaking every metal crate on the way down. The game will also update our checkpoint once we reach the bottom of the slide, so we need to ensure that we get all the orbs, but for safety we can create a manual save at the top of the slide just in case we need to reload and try again. This takes us to some more orbs and the sixth scout fly. Now there's one more slide here that takes us down to the very bottom of the level. The problem the problem is, there's a checkpoint at the bottom of the slide, and as soon as Jack reaches the bottom, we are forced straight into a scripted rising dark eco section that requires a lot of blue eco jump pads to escape. However, there are collectibles down there that we want. Not to mention, there are orbs on the second slide itself that we want too. We'll tackle the slide first. We make a manual save at the top just in case. Now, once again, we slide down, collecting all the orbs and breaking all the metal crates whilst avoiding all eco. This is easier said than done though. The second slide is a fair bit more difficult. A useful trick though, if we miss any of the metal crates, we can pause the game, save the game, and then reload the game. We will load back at the top of the slide since that was our last checkpoint, but we will keep the orbs we collected before we saved. This allows us to only focus on getting a few orbs at a time. The best example of this is when there are two orbs side by side, and getting both at once can be quite hard. If we just grab one of them, pause, save, and then reload that save, we're back at the top of the slide, and then we can then slide back down and collect the other orb. And now we have both. The end of the slide is quite difficult, but we finally pulled it off. However, it is very important that we don't allow Jack to reach the very bottom of the slide. As we mentioned, there is a checkpoint down there that basically puts us in a point of no return. As soon as we have the last orb on the slide, we need to quickly do the usual method of pausing, saving and reloading. We'll keep all the orbs and be back at the top of the slide. Now we want to get to that area at the bottom of the slide, but without using the slide, since we want to avoid triggering that checkpoint. Just before the second slide, there are two pipe covers that get blown upwards by steam. If we stand on top of the first one and time a jump as the lid is rising, we can get crazy height. Enough height that we can go right through this wall and fall down into the void. If we move back in bounds as we fall, it's possible to land inside the final section where the second slide would have taken us. Since we're so much higher up, we don't trigger the scripted scene or the checkpoint. Normally, we'd be running up this tower whilst escaping from the rising dark eco, but now we're free to traverse our way down this tower at our own pace. Of course, we take advantage of this and grab all the orbs too. There are some lurkers down here, and avoiding their green eco can be a challenge, but we take our time and we get through. There are some long falls, but we can see where we want to land with first person view. Once we get close to the bottom of the tower, we can see the last power cell of the level. That is, of course, if we exclude the scout fly power.
power cell, since we don't have that one yet. We jump down on top of this power cell to collect it, and this starts the cutscene that triggers the rising dark eco. However, as long as we never approach the bottom of the slide, our checkpoint never got updated. And also, collecting the power cell auto saves the game, which means we can avoid the rising dark eco section entirely by simply reloading that auto save right away. Once again, we're back at the top of the second slide with all collectibles secured. All we need to do now is get out of the level. We've lost our normal means to escape since we can't use the blue eco jump pads, so we'll need another way. We need to backtrack to the bottom of the first slide again and make our way up the slide as far as we possibly can. Jack isn't supposed to be able to climb back up these slides as you can see, but there is a trick to get a head start. A long jump into a high jump gets up the slide a decent amount. From there, we can quickly jump on top of a wooden crate. We make sure not to spin kick as we land, as this will break the crate. We can then double jump to the next wooden crate. It seems avoiding breaking these crates is now paying off. We now jump as far up the slide as we can, and then quickly go into first person as we land. This will keep Jack on that spot without sliding down. Here's the interesting part. We've progressed up this slide just enough to deload the checkpoint flag in the previous area. If we save and load the game now, the game won't know which checkpoint to load. So instead, it puts us right at the start of the whole level as a sort of fail safe, I guess. Of course, we could leave the level right now, but we still have that seventh scout fly to get. We progress through the level once more until we reach that third scout fly we missed. The reason we left this here till last is that we want this power cell to spawn next to this enemy. We're going to use that enemy to perform the zombie glitch again. Just like on Misty Island, we take damage until we only have one hit point left. Then we stand next to the power cell, wait for the enemy to approach, and then spin kick the enemy and the power cell at the same time. The reason it needs to be this enemy in particular is that it can inflate itself like a puffer fish, which makes it invulnerable. Kicking it when it's inflated just hurts Jack instead, which is perfect for activating the zombie glitch. After getting this right, we need to carry the zombie glitch all the way back to Rock Village. So this means avoiding all damage between here and there. For some reason, bonking into a wall with either a long jump or a punch also deactivates the glitch, so we must avoid doing that as well. Also, that was the last power cell in the Precursor City, which means we got all eight of them. We also got 180 out of 200 orbs because 20 of them were in another vent. We travel back to the Precursor Basin, but just like before, the zombie glitch prevents us from riding the Zuma. We can still get up there without it though. We just need to use another long jump into a high jump and we can get up onto the left side. There is a very tall invisible wall in our way which prevents us from reaching the Precursor Basin on foot, but we can high jump onto the rock wall to the left. Just like with the window on Sentinel Beach, these rocks are considered to be floor, so we can spam the jump button next to these rocks until we reach the top. Soon we'll be high enough to clear the invisible wall and enter the Precursor Basin without the Zuma. The plan is to take out the four flying lurkers that we had to skip before, and with our zombie glitch active, we won't be forced into collecting green eco. The problem with that is that we're stuck on foot, which makes chasing them down quite difficult. But the game is also not quite prepared for us to be on foot here, so the flying lurkers' flight patterns can be a bit erratic. It's possible to cut them off with well-timed punch uppercuts. I was able to hit one of these lurkers doing this myself, but getting all four of them is a nightmare. Continuous long jumps is the best way to keep up with them, but we run the risk of bonking into the wall doing this, which would mean having to get the zombie glitch and travelling back here all over again. Thankfully, a member of the Jack and Daxter speedrun discord server, Melanister, came to my rescue. They proved that with enough patience and skill, you can indeed hit all four of them on foot. That brings our total power cells in the Precursor Basin to seven out of eight. We can now move on to the next hub area, which means travelling through the mountain pass, where we are immediately met by a boss fight against Claw. The only way to defeat Claw is to use Blue Eco to create platforms and then use Yellow Eco to shoot him. So it's a good thing we have a much easier way. We're going to use a trick called the Idle Deload. I'll explain as we go. First, we need to save the mountain pass level in the game's memory. There are a few ways to do this, and these include activating a cutscene in that area, dying in that area, or letting 
letting Jack's idle animation play by standing still for 30 seconds. A cutscene does play the first time we enter the mountain pass to introduce the boss, but just to be safe, we can jump into the lava and die. As soon as we do that, the area is stored in memory. It then reloads the level from that memory and thus we respawn in the same area in front of the boss. Next, we need to backtrack and enter a different level entirely. In this instance, the best level to travel to is Boggy Swamp, but whilst we're traveling there, we need to make sure that we don't die, don't activate a cutscene, and make sure we don't stand still for 30 seconds. If any of these things happen, we will overwrite the level that's in the game's memory and we'll have to start this entire process over again. Once we arrive at Boggy Swamp, we need to advance at least as far as this rock before the thorns. Now, all we have to do is hold down the circle button for 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, Jack's idle animation will play. The game considers this animation to be a cutscene and the game tries to load in the current area in memory like before but there is a one frame window where we can cancel the game's memory update. With the circle button held down, the game registers a circle input every frame. Even though Jack isn't spin kicking constantly, the game still registers the input. Since circle can be used to cancel the memory update, the game can't back up Boggy Swamp to memory, so when the game tries to reload that level from memory after the idle animation, it can't find Boggy Swamp, and instead it finds Mountain Pass. This will then deload Boggy Swamp and load in Mountain Pass, which of course means we fall to our death in the void. The game now wants to respawn Jack in Mountain Pass, since that's the level that the game has loaded in, and it will spawn him at the closest checkpoint by proximity to where he died. This is why we have to advance at least as far as that rock, since this location is closer to the Mountain Pass checkpoint that is beyond the Claw boss fight, and that is exactly where we respawn. The boss fight has been skipped completely. Now we are racing some flying lurkers across the rest of the mountain pass, and if they get to the end first, they blow up the mountain and it's game over. It's only made difficult by the fact that there's plenty of eco to avoid along the way. We can take our time at first to collect all the orbs, break all the metal crates, and grab all the scout flies. We'll lose the race like this, but we'll keep our collectibles. The biggest challenge of this race is right at the end. There are three blue eco vents in a row in a narrow corridor, and dodging them on this zoomer is very difficult when trying to go fast. The hardest one to avoid is definitely the first one. Even when it looks like we avoided it with a well-timed jump, we still end up getting the blue eco. After enough trial and error, we learned that if we slow down right before the eco vent, we could jump on the right side to just avoid touching it. The other two are easier to avoid as long as we don't bump off the wall. With that, we're on the home stretch. We win the race and ram into the lurker at the end. Only there was a green eco crate right behind him that I didn't see in time. So I had to redo it all over again. This time we avoid the eco vents, collect the last orbs on the level, grab the last scout fly, ram into the lurker at the end and avoid the green eco crates. There's still one more power cell we can get here and we need to backtrack on foot to find it. The game doesn't really want us doing this. So the gaps that the zoomer would normally ramp over are far too wide for Jack to jump across. Or they would be if we didn't use the boosted jump. We avoid the eco on foot and now we can see that the power cell is on a high platform. We carry on backtracking though because the entrance is further back. Soon we see a large boulder blocking a tunnel. Normally we would use yellow eco from a nearby vent to blow up the rock. But since we're on foot, you can actually just high jump and spin kick your way right over it. We long jump over the following gap, making sure not to hit any of the wooden crates as we do, and grab the power cell. This gives us a total of three out of four power cells in the mountain pass, since there is one for defeating the boss that we skipped. We did get all 50 orbs though. We finally arrive at Volcanic Crater. And there's not much to say about the vast majority of the collectibles here, as they can all be reached just fine with only one exception. There is a metal crate on a high rocky ledge that we cannot break without eco. The crate contains a power cell rather than orbs, which means we can still get all 50 orbs here. 
This is about the point we travelled back to Rock Village to hand in the rest of our orbs for the remainder of the power cells in that hub area. That is 6 out of 6 power cells for Rock Village. However, this meant that we didn't have enough orbs to trade in Volcanic Crater, and there are 6 power cells here, but we'll need a lot more orbs first. So we'll take the gondola up to the next level, Snowy Mountain. To start with, this level can be played as normal. We stand on these machines to deactivate them, and we grab all the collectibles on the way. There are a few things we seemingly can't do without Eco though. We can find both Red Eco and Yellow Eco here. Red Eco powers up Jack's attacks, which is useful for defeating the shield lurkers that we find in this area, whilst the Yellow Eco would have been useful for breaking open the metal crates. So we'll have to find ways around both of these. The shield lurkers cannot be attacked head on without Red Eco, so we will need to land a surprise attack. They're relentless in their pursuit though, and they will chase us whenever they can see us. They even fire homing projectiles at us too. However, if we hang over a nearby edge, the shield lurker will sometimes lose interest and lower their guard. If we pull ourselves up, the shield lurker will just return to face us again immediately. We need to wait until it lowers its guard, and then we turn the camera away from the lurker until it's off screen. Now, when we pull ourselves up, since we can't see the lurker on screen, it should still have its guard lowered. It seems the lurker's AI doesn't kick in whilst it's off screen, so if we move towards it whilst keeping the camera pointed away, we can quickly land a surprise attack to defeat it. We do this with the other two shield lurkers in the level for a power cell. Just be sure to avoid the green eco that they drop to. On our way to the next power cell, we had a very close call with some green eco, so we just waited here for it to despawn. The game intends us to use red eco to power Jack up and fight our way through a horde of these small all enemies. So we'll just have to dodge every single enemy and Dark Eco Crate instead. This went surprisingly well. We were able to clean up a few more collectibles like the power cell for standing on all these machines, getting all seven scout flies, and the hidden power cell underground. There is also a flut flut platforming section that doesn't include any eco at all, but it does get us a few more orbs. There are a few orb vents we can't get though, but there's still some progress we can make here. The only way to obtain any more collectibles is with Flut Flut. Just like in Boggy Swamp, Flut Flut is isolated to his own small section of the map, but also like in Boggy Swamp, we're going to free him. We return to the Flut Flut, and once again, there is an invisible wall preventing us from leaving this area with the Flut Flut. This invisible wall is very tall, so we'll never get over the top of it. However, if we jump against the rock wall to our left, it's possible to double jump over the rocks, and then go around the invisible wall and land on the other side. Now we can break all the metal crates that we saw in this level for the last few orbs. This puts our total on 155 out of 200, since 45 orbs are inside vents. There is one more use for Flut Flut before we finish this level. Remember that metal crate back in Volcanic Crater? We're going to break it with this Flut Flut. Getting the Flut Flut to that crate is the hard part. We ride the Flut Flut all the way to the start of the snowy mountain near the gondola that brought us up here. We can see Volcanic crater down below, but if we fall off the edge, we hit a death plane and just die. However, if we run over the edge about here and perform an optimal double jump, it's possible to get far enough to avoid the death plane completely. With this, we can fall back down to Volcanic Crater with the Flut Flut. Upon landing, it turns invisible since we were never meant to get the Flut Flut down here, but we can still ride it as normal. There is still a problem though. This whole game is full of invisible loading triggers. Walking from one place to another will deload far away areas and load in closer areas. This occurs whenever we touch one of these invisible loading triggers, and if we touch a loading trigger in Volcanic Crater whilst riding the Flut Flut, the game will just crash. The metal crate is located underneath where we jump from in Snowy Mountain, and then a bit to the right, but that area is completely closed off by loading triggers. However, it's possible to go over these loading triggers as as we fall. If we start to move down right after we clear the death plane, we can fall towards the area with the metal crate and land on the other side of the loading triggers. We're not in the clear yet though, we still need to navigate across the track and over to the crate. We can use the height from the passing minecart to just land a ground pound and I failed this many times, but we finally broke the metal crate, only to land in the lava.
lava right afterwards. It's okay though, because the power cell that we freed remains on the ground after we respawn, so we can just go back there and pick it up as normal. We also managed to get all eight power cells in Snowy Mountain too. This brings us to the Spider Cave. There is a lot of platforming in this level, but it's all done without eco. What does require yellow eco though, is defeating the gnawing lurkers. We don't have any other way of damaging them, so we can't get the power cell for defeating them all. This is the only power cell here we can't get though. We can still get the rest by breaking all the dark gems or platforming to all the high ledges. There is a platforming section in the dark, but as long as we can avoid the enemy's green eco, we're fine. There are a few metal crates dotted about, but we can't do anything about those for now. We'll also start to run into these drilling lurkers on narrow bridges. We usually play it safe by waiting for it to turn its back on us, get a quick kill, and then backing away until the green eco despawns. Next, we come to the scaffolding section. It's a lengthy climb to the top of some tall wooden scaffolding. On the way up, we face drill lurkers, eco, fire, trapdoors, and spike hazards. There's also a couple of rows of metal crates on the lower levels of the scaffolding that we can't break for now. On the way up, we find the last scout fly for a power cell. Once we get to the top, we find another power cell. We can already see yet another power cell on a far ledge and it's right next to some blue eco. At first, it looks like a booster jump would be needed to get up there, but it turns out a regular double jump into a spin kick is enough to grab the edge. Now, we come to a pole swinging section that leads to a lot more orbs, but it also has a lot of blue eco in the way. We need to swing from pole to pole, but there are certain poles we cannot grab as they are too close to blue eco. As long as we are super careful, we can grab all these orbs and completely avoid all the blue eco. After that, we grab another power cell in a nearby cave. This leaves us with seven out of eight power cells, but there's still plenty of orbs remaining. In fact, there are five orbs high above this blue eco jump pad right here. The jump pad is a shortcut back to the top floor of the cave, near the start of the level, and we can actually find the other end of this shortcut. You'll know it by this circular hole here. If we want to get these orbs, we can use another idle deload. Simply go to the furthest area of the cave, near the poles, then wait 30 seconds for an idle animation. This will store this part of the spider cave in memory. Now we return to the circular hole. Make sure to stand on the ground next to the hole and not on top of it. This is because Jack cannot perform an idle animation on moving platforms. Now we press and hold circle for 30 seconds, just like before. This will deload this part of the cave and load in the far part of the cave again. The circular platform blocking the hole will also deload as a result of this and we can quickly jump down and grab those orbs as we fall. There are still some metal crates on this level that we cannot break open, and we can't get Flut Flut into the spider cave without the game crashing. There is one other way to break these metal crates though, and it's called fall damage. Yeah, basically, if Jack lands on top of these metal crates from a great height, we would take damage, but the crate would still break open. There is something we can do to make it easier. If we grab the edge as we fall, the fall damage that we would have taken will be stored. It will remain stored until Jack's feet touch the ground. This means that if we grab the edge near the crate, pull ourselves up and then land on the metal crate, it still breaks. This is because the game takes about three frames to decide whether Jack should take fall damage or not upon landing on the ground. Since we can store the fall damage by grabbing on an edge and then landing on a crate right afterwards, the crate will break immediately before the three frames. We can actually chain bounces like this together to break multiple crates in a row. This is all well and good for the metal crates that have high platforms above them, but there are still a few metal crates in the spider cave that have low ceilings above them. We can't land directly on top of these crates from high above, but we can take advantage of the fall damage storage in another way. If we hit the ground from a high fall, but then quickly jump again before three frames passes, we can still store the fall damage in this way. If we were skilled enough, we could time this jump multiple times in a row, chaining them together and traveling around the level like this. I tried this myself many times and I found out that it's a lot harder than it looks. Fortunately, a member of the Jack and Daxter speedrun discord server, Six Rock, is indeed skilled enough to pull off this series of quick jumps to break all the remaining crates in the spider cave. 
I am happy knowing that this is possible to preserve my own sanity. Well done, Six Rock. This now puts us on 7 out of 8 power cells and 185 out of 200 orbs. This is all because of the gnawing lurkers. Each of them give orbs upon defeating them, and defeating all of them rewards us with a power cell. And since Yellow Eco is the only thing that can hurt them, we'll never get these collectibles. It's time for one last Zuma section, Lava Tube. There are plenty of orbs and crates to break along the way through the tunnel. It can be difficult to grab everything and get all the cooling balloons as well, but if we die, we keep all the collectibles anyway. There is a lot of yellow eco vents on the way as well, so we need to avoid those too. Before long, we find ourselves trapped in a round room. It's intended that we destroy the mechanism in the center of the room with yellow eco. Otherwise, the exit door won't open. This means we'll have to find another way through the door, or should I say, over the door. If we drive into the right spot on the left side of the door with enough of a run up, it's possible to ramp up and over the top. It took quite a long time to pull this off. It's really quite precise which part of the door frame you have to drive into, but once we're over there, we can grab the last scout fly for the power cell. We avoid more yellow eco and grab the power cell at the end of the lava tube. That's both power cells and all 50 orbs in this level. Now begins the final level of the game, the Citadel. We're supposed to navigate this large round area and rescue the sages from their cages one by one. A lot of blue eco is intended to be used to get around this whole level, so this already looks impossible. If we can free all the sages, then platforms will appear that leads to the very top of the level, which is ultimately where we want to be. But if we could get up there without having to rescue the sages, that would bypass the need for blue eco. It just so happens there is a way. And it's quite strange. As soon as we walk into the Citadel, the game plays a cutscene right away. For some reason, this cutscene updates our latest checkpoint to be the very top of the level. So, as soon as the cutscene is over, if we take a step forward, the game will update our checkpoint back to where we're standing, at the start of the level. But this means that if we just pause the game after the cutscene immediately without moving, save the game, and then reload that save, we will spawn at the checkpoint at the very top of the level. There's actually a faster method of abusing this trick that speedrunners use, and it was too interesting to not include in this video. First, we need to learn a trick called pause buffering. To perform a pause buffer in this game, we either press L2 or R2 along with the pause button on the exact same frame. Normally, L2 or R2 would show the heads up display, but if we press pause at the exact same time, the pause is delayed until the heads up display goes away. We'll know we've got the timing right as the number that usually shows next to our health isn't there. It takes 2.5 seconds for the heads up display to go away at this point, and then the game will pause itself automatically since it's still queuing the pause action. During this 2.5 seconds, we can still move around, but cutscenes will not be activated. If we touch a trigger for a cutscene during those 2.5 seconds, it won't play until the 2.5 seconds are up. We can actually use this to skip some cutscenes entirely. For example, at the end of Lava Tube, we can hit a button to power up a teleporter. This also activates a cutscene of Kira coming through the teleporter. If we use a pause buffer, then quickly hit the button, the cutscene won't play until those 2.5 seconds have counted down. However, if we get the pause buffer, then hit the button, and then quickly death abuse in the nearby lava, we respawn at the teleporter, since that's our checkpoint, and Kira is already standing there. This means the cutscene has been skipped completely. This is exactly what speedrunners do to the cutscene at the very start of Citadel. We stand just outside the door, pause buffer, and then very quickly long jump through the cutscene trigger and over the edge, thus falling to our death. If we didn't fall in time, then the cutscene might still play, but if we got far forward enough, we will die immediately from the fall following the cutscene, and since the cutscene updated the checkpoint to be at the top, that is exactly where we respawn. From here, we can free the green sage first for a power cell, but we still want to free all the other sages in the level to create that bridge back up here. From up top, we can see all the buttons down below that free each of the sages from their cages. We need to fall down onto each button one by one, making sure 
sure not to go too close to any doorways since we do not want our checkpoint to get updated. Once we free a sage, we death abuse to spawn back up top again, and then we fall down and free the next sage, and so on and so forth. This avoids needing any eco to reach each sage from the ground, and we also get a power cell for each sage that we rescue. Once they're all free, they create a bridge to the upper floor, which means we can now freely traverse this level as we hunt for the rest of the collectibles. Since we can explore a majority of this level now, this means we can get all the scout flies, which not only means we can get all five power cells here, this means that we can actually get all 112 scout flies in the entire game. The biggest challenge we face in this level is getting all the orbs. There are 200 in total, but 90 of them are stuck inside eco vents. This means that we can only hope to collect 110 of them. Several of them are found on these coloured platform puzzles, and this led us to a side path full of small bouncing lurkers. We're supposed to use red eco to help fight them all off, but we must avoid that red eco and defeat them all without it. It's a bit more difficult, but it's still very doable. There's also a few metal crates in this corridor, which is awkward because there's no high up ledges above them to help us abuse the fall damage storage. To make this more difficult, the path leading to these metal crates requires jumping over moving platforms, but Six Rock is back again to save the day. He was able to fall a long way down in the main area and maintain fall damage storage all the way across these moving platforms and break all of these metal crates. In the next section there are three platforms that rise up with blue eco. Above each platform is three orbs. We will never reach these with regular jumps, but there is a part of the bridge that sticks out upwards. If we use the boosted jump from there, we can just about grab a few of these orbs. We can't reach them all from here though. There is a higher ledge nearby, but even doing a boosted jump from there still doesn't reach all of them. Just two of these orbs in this area are simply out of reach. The final section of this level is a series of moving blue eco jump pads. We simply cannot reach these jump pads without blue eco. Even if we get as close as possible and perform our best boosted jumps for maximum distance, we just cannot reach. I tried this one boosted jump for days. It just looks like it should be possible. Unfortunately, this prevents us from reaching several orbs floating above these jump pads, which means we were only able to get 80 out of 200 orbs. Since 90 of them are inside the vents, that's 30 orbs that are simply out of our reach. We did make one last ditch effort to get those orbs though. We'll start by taking the big elevator to the roof. Up here is a platform powered by Blue Eco that takes us to the final boss of the game. Before we deal with that, we want to try an experiment. If we fall off the edge here, instead of falling all the way back down to the bottom, we hit a death plane. This death plane stretches out very far and we would never clear it. However, there is a couple of very small gaps in the death plane. In the open goal version of the game, we can make the death plane visible and it is a giant red square. If we use zoom walking to slowly lower ourselves over the edge, we can see the gaps in the death plane under the rooftop. Zoom walking can help us fall through these gaps, and thus begins the very long and slow descent all the way back down to the citadel interior. We just have to ensure that we touch this yellow load trigger on the way down to ensure the citadel loads in properly. As soon as we bypass that yellow load trigger, we now want to zoom walk all the way towards the orbs that we couldn't reach. This is a very long process, and one mistake means we fall out of the air and that would mean starting the process all over again. Unfortunately, it seems we can't reach any of the remaining orbs like this. We lose too much altitude before we get the distance we need. In our attempt, we just clipped the top of this wall, which dropped us to the ground before we could get close enough to the orbs. It didn't look like we were going to make it anyway, to be honest. Plus, zoom walking for that long hurts my thumb. Instead, we go back to Volcanic Crater and hand over all our orbs until we have all eight power cells there. So, we'll move on to the final boss. As mentioned, there's a platform powered by Blue Eco that takes us over there. If we want to get over there without Eco, we will need to use one final idle deload. We wait for an idle animation on the roof, then ride the elevator back down again. We traverse to a point that is closer in proximity to the platform that the boss is on. Once we're there, we do the usual, we hold circle for 30 seconds, deload the level 
level, fall off the edge, die and respawn right in front of the final boss. And this is where the run dies. The only way to deal any damage is with yellow eco, and after that we need to use the blue eco jump pads to avoid the explosions. It is possible to avoid the explosions without eco, but it's very difficult. It uses a trick we haven't actually used in this run yet, and it's called the rocket uppercut. Do you remember the trick where we can jump whilst touching any vertical surface that the game considers to be floor? Well, the sides of the opening in the centre of this platform are considered to be floor. Another way to take advantage of this trick is to uppercut whilst touching the side of a quote-unquote floor. The game interrupts the uppercut animation and tries to place Jack in a standing state, but the momentum of the uppercut continues, which can result in a lot of height. At the apex of this height, we can enter first person view, which the game allows since it thinks Jack is in a standing state. This puts Jack's height at about level with the explosive. We can exit first person and then perform a double jump at the perfect time to just get enough height to avoid the explosion. You would need to perform this very difficult trick for every explosion during the fight, but regardless, without yellow eco we still can't cause any damage whatsoever. Can you beat Jack and Daxter the precursor legacy without eco. No, you can't. And all because of the final boss. We simply have to leave the world's fate in the hands of Gol and Maya. After all, eco is just far too dangerous, right? We were able to collect 90 out of 101 power cells, 1657 precursor orbs out of 2000, and all 112 scout flies. If you can do any better in a no eco run then please let me know how you did it in the comment section below. Or better yet, why not follow our Twitch or join our Discord server and tell me directly. Before you do though, if you enjoy challenge runs like this, you're in the right place. Please subscribe and maybe share the video with a friend. Speaking of friends, I need to thank all our friends who have supported us. They are A Lazy Dragon, Argosius, Alti Biscuit93, Big Wolf Chris, Bread General Doc, Cheesy Man3, Cookie560, Crawling Relsa, Dark Matter TV, Davs Brander, Dino1303, D Stut, Duncan F93, Evolve Pixel, Finn Living with a Ghost, Frisbee Tossed, Frost Storm Wind, Fumble Bottle, Girly Spider, Hacky Joey14, Ham Scoffer, Heaven's Petals, Henaman1, Holly Kitten Love, Insomakins, Invdu, Itsu. Lucifer, Jesus Christ 00 AD, Jin 0505, John Von Baslake, Kami7, Krifos, Lacerated Hunter, Lagoos T, Lasku Taito, I Hoffman, Mel3 Phyllis, Major Vengeance, Megachonk Seal, Mel Phyllis, Miss Barbs, Oshu Buds, Platonic Penguin, Cyvel, RNR66, Soldier Arkham, Some Lost Gamer, Spectrum Z90, Star Disc, Static Jokes, 10 Divide by 6, TG Side Effects, That Chloe is Odd, The Jammy Emperor, Tim Zero, Tor ZH, Tauster, True DK Zero, Tyrant Z, Viridian Adventure, Vokagami, and XD Curtis DX. And of course our patrons as well, A Lazy Dragon, Anthony Kermack, LED23, Skirts, Stefan Foot, and Tor. What a good looking bunch of people. Also a big thank you to everyone on the Jack and Daxter speedrun discord server who helped me out, especially to Sixrock and Milanister for allowing me to show their footage. Give them a follow if you enjoy Jack and Daxter content. If you'd like to see more challenge runs on classic platformers then we have a full playlist of Spyro challenges and another one for Ratchet and Clank challenges, they're both on screen now. Does anyone ever actually click on these links at the end?